Modern man's humanistic thought has come down in many, many forms until at a certain point of history, now we put it in the early 1960s, people heard this same message coming at them from absolutely every side. Whether they read the book of philosophy, or they went into the art museum, or they listened to music, or they read a modern novel, or they went to the philosophic cinema, it was always the same. And that is uh, that on the humanistic basis, reason leads to despair, uh, to no answers. And people should try to find answers in the area of non-reason. It had brought people to the place where there were no fixed values whatsoever. These were completely gone. And the great majority of people had come to the place where they had only two horrendous values, absolutely horrible values, personal peace and affluence. As I use the term personal peace, I mean I want to be left alone. And I don't care what happens to the man across the street or across the world. I want my own lifestyle to be undisturbed, regardless of what it will mean even to my own children and grandchildren. Now that's what I mean by personal peace. Affluence means things, 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 always more things, and success seen as an abundance of things. In the early 60s, a whole generation had been injected by the teaching that reason leads only to pessimism in the area of a meaning of life and of any values. Students have been hearing this from the professors for a long, long time. Understood, interpreted. One, therefore, is... As a matter of fact, there was a generation that had never been taught anything else. But there was an inconsistency here because most of these professors who taught that life had no meaning and there were no fixed values, they didn't live that way. They were living in the memory of the past. But we should not have been surprised that at a certain point of time, one generation would act, really act, upon what they had been taught. These students looked around them, and they saw these two horrible values of personal peace and affluency being on every side, and they revolted. And that revolution was Berkeley, 1964. Looking back into that which is now past history, we don't understand where we are today unless we take a moment to understand the flow through Berkeley of 1964. They really wanted to escape the two values of personal peace and affluence. And they did it in two different ways. First of all came the drug scene, the hippie scene. And we, we've already seen in a previous episode that Aldous Huxley said that as reason does not, humanistic reason doesn't give a meaning to life, and we can't find objective truth, give drugs to well people uh, in order that they might f try to find truth inside of their own head. The hippie world followed this, and they followed it very explicitly. It was an ideology to them. Let's not make any mistake. Back in those days, it was really an ideology. They really believed in it. They really believed that if you could just take and put uh, drugs into the drinking water, LSD, into the drinking water of the reservoirs of the cities of the world, and you had enough people turned on that civilization's problems would be solved. They believed it with all their heart. Getting high with the help of your friends. It's a very powerful uh, message. About the same time at Berkeley, there rose a second element in this attempt to escape these two terrible values of personal peace and affluency. This was the free speech movement. At first, the free speech movement on Sproul Plaza was neither left nor right. It was simply a desire, a demand that they have a right to have freedom, to have political rallies uh, on Sproul Plaza. 
And by God, people, we have to push Regan right back to the wall. And if we have to, we got to push him right through the wall. And we got to tell him, no, baby, this is our university. But quickly, it slipped into the new left following Marcuse. Marcuse was a German philosopher, a Marxist, and at that time he was teaching at San Diego. This spread over the whole world. We can think, for example, of the Paris riots in 1968. Here they are seeking freedom from these two values. They had the right analysis. Let me say that as somebody who was older. They had the right analysis. This was where our society was, with just two terrible values of personal peace and fluency. But the tragedy was, they tried the wrong solutions. The drug culture came to its height at Woodstock at the festival there in 1969. But in Altima, in 1969, there was another uh, festival, uh, and uh, the Hell's Angels, who were hired to police the ground, killed at least one man. And the Rolling Stone, the magazine, came out and quoted someone after that as saying, we've lost our age of innocency. The drug culture was finished. It was completely finished after the Isle of Wight Festival in 1970, which ended so ugly, in such an ugly fashion in Europe. After that drug taking change, mind you, not less people taking drugs unhappily, but no longer taking them as an ideology. The unhappy thing is probably more people are taking drugs and taking them at a younger age. But drug taking as an ideology was absolutely done. The new left went the same way, gradually ground down. It brought forth naturally uh, violence, violence in the United States, violence in Europe, and the idealistic young people really didn't like the violence that it just reasonably and naturally brought forth. In 1970, the radical students bombed the University of Wisconsin lab building, killing a graduate student. Bombs continued to be planted in the United States, and a small, hardcore of radicals continues to exist. But the violence of the new left, climaxing in the bombing of this laboratory building, made most young people in the United States no longer see the new left as a hope. So here the students were, and they had tried to escape these two awful values of personal peace and fluency, and now their two hopes, the new left and the drug thing, was gone. What were they left with? And they were left with apathy. Apathy. Many, many people were so glad when the universities quieted down at that time. And in one way, it's good it did quiet down. But I could have wept, and I did weep as I met these young people after this. All they had left was apathy. And they had tried to escape their parents' poor values, their society's poor values, and they'd gone around in a circle and come back and ended one inch lower. And now apathy ruled uh, with them. And what was left? The two values of personal peace and affluency now ruled supreme. Now, let's move on a bit. As the Christian consensus dies as the basis of our culture, Society does not really have many bases upon which it has the possibility of building. One is uh, that everybody would simply do their own thing. And this has the technical name of hedonism. It means everybody would do what they want to do. But the simple fact is that it is not possible to build a society on everybody doing what they want to do. I often think of the illustration of two men trying to do their own thing, regardless of what anybody else thinks, meeting on a narrow bridge. And as they meet on the narrow bridge, something has to happen. They both can't do their own thing. Everybody understands you can't build a society on people doing what they want to do.